All right, so the next uh, stream we have today is going to be powered by Al Ahdeth. Our speaker, who is about to come on stage, is going to talk to us about branding. Now, we all know about branding. We support certain brands. We buy certain brands. They affect our lives every single day. Mm -hmm. And there's people behind these brands that make all the tiny little decisions that get you guys going, that make you actually take the purchase, get interested, follow them on Instagram. And so our next speaker has spoken all around the world at, in helping small and large businesses alike from Fortune 500 companies to also assisting the Obama Council. Wow. So <laughs> I'd like to introduce to you the wonderful and fabulous Nick Vestergaard. Hello. Uh, supposed to talk with the music or or just do a little bit of that that seemed appropriate at the time so I am excited to be here chatting with you a little bit about branding this important thing that we talk a lot about but quick show of hands who thinks that brands are a pretty important thing yeah all right hands back down now Raise your hand if you are investing significantly in your brand in the year ahead. Mm, hands are a little more timid. It's okay, it's hard, isn't it? Because branding doesn't feel that new. It's not one of these shiny new things that we've been talking about. It feels a little old. It feels a little stuffy. What do you say about branding? You're not alone. I, I had the same reaction when a colleague at the University of Iowa, where I teach, offered uh, me to take over his branding classes for the semester while he went on sabbatical. I thought, what am I going to say about branding? So I avoided the problem, as I often do, by going to Costco with my then two-and-a-half-year-old son. Now, he doesn't have that many words in his vocabulary, so I was surprised when all of a sudden, while walking through the aisle, he says, coffee. Now, I'm the parent of five kids, so my first response when he says coffee is, where? <laughs> but then I, I'm curious, because we're not in the coffee aisle. I'm, I'm looking all over the place for where he's getting this from, and I see finally these big boxes of coffee, like you find at Costco. And he it doesn't say coffee, he can't read coffee, but he knows the Starbucks mermaid, because... He's our youngest of five kids. He tags along with us everywhere. He knows that when we see the mermaid, we say coffee, we go and we have a drink. Whether we are at a store, whether we're in a grocery store, he knows that that means coffee. So it occurs to me that brands, if they can imprint on even a two and a half year old, they still have something to say. But we need a better definition because too often we think of that kind of old timey burning the cow definition of branding. So what I want to walk through are inner brands four stages of branding, starting with the first stage, which is, yes, sadly, the cow burning thing. But it was all about identity, the Industrial Revolution. We are making things. It's important to tell them apart. These are your products. Those are my products. This is your sugar water. That is Coca-Cola. And of course, that held for most of the 20th century until we had the financial heyday of the 80s, mergers, acquisitions. All of a sudden, IBM isn't just in mainframe computing, they are in consulting. So it's important to communicate that value. Steve Jobs ushered in the third era by inviting us all to experience going into the Apple brand via Apple stores. And this was taken even further by brands like Amazon embracing digital technology to rebuild the ecosystem around us as consumers. So that's why your Amazon homepage looks different from mine and why they look different on mobile via desktop. And speaking of Amazon, we trust those peer reviews. 90% of us trust those peer reviews, but only 33% trust advertising. So you could look at this and say, if we're going to talk about branding, it sounds like branding is, is sort of dead. 
but it's actually as powerful as ever. Traditional brand advertising may be dead, but brand equity has a 90% greater impact on pricing power, preference, and loyalty, both online and in store. With this technology, we have the potential to scale word of mouth in ways we've never thought of, and yet there's a 21% drop in people who say that they understand brands. So we can communicate more, but people are understanding less. So it's important for our brands to move from person to person, from community to community. And to create that movement, we need to get scientific, and as scientific as I'm going to get for now, thinking about physics, because a dynamic is a force that stimulates change or progress within a system. So what I want to walk through in our time together are seven brand now dynamics. The first one is meaning. So I talk about branding a lot at events like this all over the world. And usually when I walk off stage, I'm met by someone. They're standing right there. Their chest is puffed out. They're very excited. And they say, guess what? We've just rebranded. And they rock back a bit. Big smile. And they say, yep, we just redid our whole logo. Ah. <laughs> I look for any excuse to get out of the conversation. Hey, hey, where'd you get that brownie? So it's awkward, this connection with the logo. But actually, it gets us on the right path because the logo comes from the Greek word logos, which is the logic behind an argument. Frankel's logotherapy shows us that our primary motivation as humans is to search for meaning. So that tells us that standout brands stand for something. We know that we're not just looking at logos here. We are looking at remarkable brands that mean something to us, that it's not just the Lululemon logo, that that is where we go to feel good about ourselves in a fitness environment, that BarkBox isn't just selling us dog toys. It's that feeling we get from being able to give our dog a special gift. A mini isn't just a car. It is that feeling of excitement and community that we get as many drivers seeing another Mini coming down the road at us. So beyond what it is you do, what box you fill as a business, it's important to remember how you appeal to both the head and the heart of those that you serve. So you have to think about what that meaning is. Now, I, I can't speak here and talk about brands without talking about one of my favorite Scandinavian brands. Everybody loves Ikea, but Ikea isn't just in the furniture business. They are about that feeling you get from furnishing your home. Dan Ariely at Duke actually studied this phenomenon and wrote a paper on it where he outlines the Ikea effect. And that basically says that when we go to all of that trouble of putting together that shelf, it means more to us. So that's remarkable. So what you need to ask yourself is what business you're really in. Not just what type of company you are, what box you fill, but what service you really provide in the hearts and minds of your community. So for meaning, we move on to structure. How we go about this act of branding. Now it could sound like hair splitting, but I'm a word nerd. I don't really like branding because it sounds like something you do to someone else. I much like the idea of brand building. That's something that we can do together. That is both an art and a science. And like the science of DNA, we have brand DNA as well. Your logo, slogan, business cards, products, packaging, website, advertising, direct mail, signage, all of these things that very quickly sounds like a checklist. But in thinking about checklists, I'm not a huge fan because it leads to arbitrarily checking those items on the list, off of the list, and it leads to trying to do everything instead of trying to do what makes the most sense for you and your consumers. I much like the idea of dimmer switches. I went to uh, the back of one of these ballrooms, and I'm sure you can find those dimmer switches where you can turn different lights up and different lights down. I would invite you to think about your brand in the same way and turn some of those touch points up based on 
your meaning. For example, Zappos isn't just a shoe company. They're in the business of delivering happiness, of service. That's why their service touch points are turned way up and why you don't see TV advertising for them. It's why this email that I got about boots that I had that a sole fell off of a week after having them was wonderfully worded and very creative and told me I could keep the defective boots and turn them into an art project. It's great for Zappos. This is Megan Foster. She is a University of Iowa educator. She is a small business owner. She is an elected official, and she is the mother of five kids. And if you've not pieced it together at this point, she is my wife, and I I'm trying to build up her resume because I'm going to tell a story that doesn't paint her in the best light. So we have five kids, we're very busy, we blow off steam in different ways. One of her favorite ways of doing this is subscription box clubs, things like Stitch Fix, where you get a curated box of goodies every month. One day I'm sitting along working and I hear her cry out from the next room. I race in, expecting to find an intruder, a fire, some small mammal in the house. And instead, she's sitting on the floor and she turns to me and smiles and says, the trunk club box looks like a trunk. <sighs> yes, yes, it does look like a trunk. After I got my heart rates back to normal, it occurred to me that this is a great example of a touch point turned way up for a very specific reason. You're never gonna walk into the trunk club brand, but that box is how it's delivered to you. Tesla throws so many things that automakers do out the window. They don't have dealerships, they don't have advertising, but they have Elon Musk's Twitter feed. Brands like Sriracha Sauce, WD-40, have remarkable packaging. So think about which of those touch points you can turn way up and which ones you can turn down as well to help structure your brand. Our third dynamic is story. And I want to stick with Elon Musk because the way he blows off steam is uh, this other small startup he has called SpaceX, which recently, in uh, their efforts to uh, promote space tourism, wanted to see if they could send something heavy up into space. Now, they probably could have built a weight, maybe the size of this stage, but what'd they do instead? They sent a Tesla up into space. And that's wonderful, and we remember it because that's a great story. Because stories, as Antonio Damasio says, are the fundamental way in which the brain organizes information in a practical and memorable manner. Forget those old commercials about your brain on drugs. Look at what happens to your brain on story. We start to connect with one another. I tell a story, you start feeling what I'm feeling. It releases a neurotransmitter called dopamine that's basically like your brain's save button. Powerful things happen when we hear stories. Stories help us transmit meaning. So we have to think about how we can tell our brand story and how we can use some of the more common story tools in doing that. Kurt Vonnegut noted that all stories have shapes, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Boy meets girl, boy gets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl back in the end. Cinderella's day starts off bad, she meets the fairy godmother, goes to the ball, loses the shoe, all is lost, then the prince comes back. And of course, Vonnegut being Vonnegut, couldn't resist plotting out Kafka, and you have Gregor Samsa's day starting off bad and getting worse, as only it can when you turn into a bug. But think about what the beginning, middle, and end of your story is. And another important story aspect to remember is that you're not the star of your story, your customer is. I was walking through Boston's Logan Airport and I discovered this amazing ad that I thought was an Oreo cookie ad. It was an Accenture ad about the work they do for Oreo. They made Oreo the star of that ad. And also in thinking about conflict, it's key to remember not to round out your brand's rough edges. Those problems that you solve for your customer, that's at the heart of your story. So your shape, 
your conflict, and also remembering to say all of this with voice. Find a unique brand voice that transcends all of the different platforms that we have. Duluth Trading Company promises underwear for the working man and women uh, called Buck Naked Underwear that they say promises no pinch, no stink. Taco Bell and Old Spice have remarkable brand voices, and sometimes they even talk with one another. As Old Spice said, why is it that fire sauce isn't made with any real fire? Seems like false advertising. Taco Bell says, Old Spice, is your deodorant made with really old spices? <laughs> to which Taco Bell said, depends. Do you consider volcanoes, tanks, and freedom to be spices? So ask yourself, what's your brand's core story? And if you're looking for a hint to find your brand's voice, think of a celebrity that would narrate a documentary about your brand and then start to extrapolate what the key traits are of their voice and how that might speak to who your brand is as well. One of the best tools for moving our brand story is the track that we are currently in right now, and that is content. Content isn't new. I have to think that some of those early cave drawings had to be about trading other cave people for a bigger, better club. But Google's Eric Schmidt turned many heads when he said that every two days we create as much information online as we did from the dawn of civilization up until 2003. Consumers are seeking out twice as much content. 80% of marketers use content across all sectors. 74% are producing more than last year. The problem? They don't have any strategy in doing any of this, which is a huge problem. So we have to think about how we can make our content more business-centric and customer aware. GoPro does an amazing job of this with their videos. As a storytelling tool, they make their, star, their customers the center of those stories instead of the technology, showcasing what they're able to do with the product. And the other problem we have with too much content is our readers are many different places at many different times, so we need to create many different levels of content. So this makes me think of the CIA, Julia Child, and Shark Week. Let me explain. So the Central Intelligence Agency actually has a pretty engaging social media presence. I know, big surprise. And they wanted to take advantage of Shark Week. And they realized that famous art of French cooking chef, Julia Child, had actually worked with the CIA to create a recipe for shark repellent. So they took this one interesting story and broke it apart and told it many different ways. For example, here is a gif of Julia chopping up shark meat. That's my best Julia Child voice. You're going to have to work with me. And then that linked out to a story, a blog post about that. And then if people wanted more of that, they could get the longer version of the story. So they created content for skimmers, swimmers, and divers. It's like last night at the sauna, I was more of a skimmer. There wasn't much diving going on into the very cold water. So with this content problem that we have, too much content, you have to ask the question, what can you and only you create? This leads us to who's helping us create all of this, our community. And in my first book, Get Scrappy, I talked about you need to embrace your people power, both internally and externally. And how we can go about organizing this is into concentric circles, circles inside other circles. So starting inside, we have to focus on our people, our employees, and how we can create a culture that better transforms them into brand ambassadors. Method, the soap company, does this through flashcards at every employee's desk with quick reminders. Zappos has a brand book. Spiceworks, an IT consulting company, has brand camp that all of their employees go to. And it's important to engage your employees because there's only an 8% overlap between your social connections as a brand and theirs as an individual. Great potential. Another IKEA example, they work the middle circle of vendors, suppliers, and partners. So it's important to think about how you can make them a part of your marketing as well. And also, 
As you think about your customers, put your best customers first. Maker's Mark does this by creating internal, uh, external rather, brand ambassadors from their best customers. Salesforce takes over the city of San Francisco every year for a great big celebration of all things Salesforce and customer related. It creates brand gravity and draws everyone in. So I want you to ask yourself, how can you get to know your circles of community even better? Our sixth dynamic is a twofer. It is clarity. Because clarity has two definitions. It's clearness or lucidity. It's also something that's transparent. So what I want to focus on with clarity is transparency and simplicity. So when it comes to communication and brands, we haven't always been the most transparent, right? Like when we found out that cigarettes were deadly, we came out with advertising that said that more doctors smoke camels. Not the best sign, but the good news is we can't do this today because of things like the internet. David Sreri says that today, if we lie, we die. So you can't have United saying to fly the friendly skies and they're beating people up and breaking their guitars. You have to be consistent in both what you say and what you do. Annalise's example of Patagonia is a great example here as well, uh, because you see that even though they know they're a clothing company, they break it down, the environmental impact that they're having, so that they can be accountable alongside you at the impact. Simplicity is key because there's a 44% increase in the perception of simplicity among the most innovative brands globally. So back to that 21% drop in people who understand brands, maybe it's because we're making things too complex. Maybe more isn't always better. Sometimes more is just more. Look at standout brands like Google who own search because of their relentless focus on keeping that search page simple with just the search box. So ask yourself, where can you simplify? Your brand name, your brand promise, products and services, website navigation. I love RX bars because they include their ingredients. It's both transparent and simple at the same time. Transparent, simple brands move faster. So in thinking about this and applying it to your brand, I would invite you to close the gaps between what you say and what you do and look for areas that you can simplify your brand experience. So brand experience brings us to our seventh and final dynamic. Brand experience is everywhere. It is all around us, sometimes even in roadside attractions. I take my kids with me over the summer when they're off of school, when I have a speaking engagement that's a road trip away, and we were coming back from Minneapolis, and we saw a sign for the Spam Museum. Anybody know about Spam? That strange little canned meat thing? So I looked over at my wife, and I said, you know, we don't have any place to be. The world is our oyster. Today is the day that we visit the Spam Museum. <laughs> Going inside, it's like the New York Stock Exchange for Spam. There are lights and displays. There are interactive activities. There are things that kids can do to put pretend Spam into cans. There are hallways, hallways in the Spam Museum dedicated to how Spam is used throughout the world. It is pretty remarkable. What do you think the point of all of this might be in me bringing that up to you today? I might have heard it, but my question would be, if spam can create an interesting brand experience, can't you? Because experience is key. Stacy Grissom from BarkBox says that branding is thousands of tiny punches that add up. So you have to think about all of those tiny punches because 70% of us believe that investing in experience is key. We all like it. Eh, not very many of us at all. 
So how can we get better at experience? Here is where we need to walk a mile in our customer's shoes. And we can create a brand touch point map by using those same concentric circles that guided us before, starting in the center with our brand DNA, our name, our logo, our brand promise. From there, our packaging, point of sale. Poopery has changed what bathroom sprays can be by packaging it like perfume. From our marketing Communication touch points. Zappos has a wonderful cat that pops up on their app that lasers your credit card number. It's wonderful. You can also engage the senses like smell as these brands have done. Your experience is your brand promise delivered. So you have to ask yourself, walking a mile in your customer's shoes, what do your circles look like? So that brings us to our seventh and final Brand Now Dynamic. What I want you to think about is your new job, because it could sound like the checklist stuff again, but I would encourage you to think more like a Hollywood producer who is coordinating all of these different areas. Not all of them might even be in your particular department. So you have to think about how you can get others engaged as well. asked you to ask a lot of questions, but if there are two big questions to think of that I want to leave you with, it is, where is your brand right now, today? And then where do you want to be? And how can you close that gap up? Because your brand isn't something that you check off a list and you're done with. It is a flag you plant in the ground and you move towards it day in, day out. And that is how you build a brand, brick by brick, day by day. That is how you brand now. Thank you very much.